Hi and thank you for watching this video. I wanted to do a quick update and to look at some of the events in the world that are currently playing out before our eyes, pointing us to the removal of the restrainer from a Christian perspective and the approaching storm that will soon come over the world from a secular perspective. If you have watched the videos I posted over the past 3-4 to four months on this channel, you will know that I have pointed out how the globalists and those who follow after the God of this world have laid their plans out before us in plain sight for all to see and what we see in the world before us today is evidence that this plan is narrowly being followed by those who are in positions of authority. In the New World Order Countdown video I stated that the date on which Brexit would occur and which is shown to us as October 31st in this plan will not be moved to a later date and I will give a little more detail and insight into this as we continue. Israel's second round of elections has ended up in another deadlock just as predicted and President Trump's deal of the century that is associated with this and that was said to be released immediately after the second round of elections has once again been postponed because the enemy's plan does not show us the release of this plan in September. Our enemy has however clearly shown us that they plan to bring about the division of Jerusalem which will be what President Trump's peace plan is all about in my opinion coinciding with the timing of Brexit between the dates of October 31st and November 2nd of 2019. Some reports have now stated that the Trump administration does not believe the plan will be released in 2019. But don't be fooled by these, as this is just done to throw you off and to cause frustration. There are some interesting aspects with regards to Brexit to consider, which serve, in my opinion, as further proof that plans have been coordinated and put in place to ensure that the UK's departure from the European Union will have the maximum impact when this catastrophe is triggered. Boris Johnson, the UK Prime Minister, has stated that he plans to leave the EU with or without a deal on October 31st, even in spite of the fact that it will now be considered a criminal offence for the UK Prime Minister to cause the departure of the UK from the EU on October 31st without a deal. This is the first aspect to keep in mind. Secondly, it just so happens that the current European Commission will reach the end of its five-year tenure on October 31st and a brand new commission with very little experience will step into office on November 1st to face the brutal impact of Brexit for which they would not have the required experience to deal with adequately. I think you will agree with me that if there was any date on which you would not want a new European Commission to step into office given the date of Brexit scheduled for October 31st, it would be November 1st as this will result in maximum chaos and maximum damage inflicted to the world economy. This is however not where it ends. A spokesperson for Boris Johnson has stated that there is a plan B in which Boris will basically ensure that the European Union cannot govern itself if they do not kick the UK out of the EU on October 31st. The EU law currently requires 28 member states to constitute the new European Commission. If the EU refuses to kick the UK out of the EU by October 31st, the UK will not supply a commissioner for the EU which means that the EU will be paralysed and not able to constitute itself on November 1st. Should the European Commission then elect to change the number to 27, the UK could then use its veto right to prevent that change to be effected, leaving the EU without a constituted commission. I believe our enemy's plan also shows us how this will play out in the end especially when we consider a specific section of this plan as penned by Albert Pike in 1871, which I have covered in more detail in previous videos which you are very welcome to watch if you have not seen these yet. This is what Pike wrote, Then everywhere the citizens obliged to defend themselves against the world minority of revolutionaries will exterminate those destroyers of civilization. In this portion of Pike's plan you will note that the world minority of revolutionaries are mentioned and that this same theme is displayed to us in the Wheel of Fortune card which appeared on the cover of the Economist magazine for the world in 2017. On this card the leaders of three EU nations are represented as revolutionaries that are explained to us in Pike's plan to be responsible for the destruction of civilization. So how would these three nations bring this about? I am of the opinion that the nations of France, Germany and the Netherlands 
or their representatives will be ultimately responsible for the storm that will come over the earth, and that this could happen in one of two ways. The first possibility is this. Should Boris Johnson stick to plan A, which is to request the EU to extend the Brexit deadline by three months in the case of having reached no agreement for a deal by October 31st, it could be that these three nations would oppose that request given the fact that a new commission is set to take office, which would then basically require Brexit terms and negotiations to be reset. Secondly, should Boris decide to go with his plan B, these three nations would ultimately be responsible for kicking the UK out of the EU on October 31st and ensuring that the new EU Commission can actually constitute itself. I believe the probability of a divorce agreement being reached between the UK and the EU before October 31st is virtually zero. And the fact that the UK government had been prorogued for five of the remaining seven weeks before Brexit occurs attests, in my opinion, to this being part of the intent. In addition to this, you will recall that I pointed out in the New World Order Countdown video that our enemy's plan also shows us their intent to cut off the supply of energy to the world and just a little over a week ago there were multiple drone strikes on Saudi Aramco's refinery in Saudi Arabia. According to reports, this removed 5% of the world's oil supply and adding a little more strain to the frail world economy in the weeks leading up to the ultimate collapse. What I found really interesting was the way in which Saudi Arabia responded to these drones that entered their airspace and carried out these attacks. There were no resistance offered and no counter-attacks were launched against these quote-unquote enemy drones. That in itself should raise a few questions of who exactly was behind these attacks and what are these attacks really supposed to bring about. This is very similar to what we saw happening on 9-11 of 2001. I recently read one of Jonathan Kahn's books called The Oracle, The Jubilean Mysteries Unveiled. Kahn explains in numerous instances how prophetic significant dates are announced by the Torah portions that Israel read every Sabbath of the year and I believe this is very important to take note of given the Torah portions that will be read during the time of Brexit. I will give a few examples first. When Mark Twain went to Jerusalem in 1867, he wrote a report of what he saw when visiting the Holy Land, being a stranger in it and coming from a far country. Here are some excerpts of what Twain had to say about the Holy Land. Palestine sits in sackcloth and ashes. Over it broods the spell of a curse that has withered its fields and fettered its energies. Renowned Jerusalem itself, the stateliest name in history, has lost all its ancient grandeur and is become a pauper village. The riches of Solomon are no longer there to compel the admiration of visiting oriental queens. The wonderful temple which was the pride and the glory of Israel is gone, and the Ottoman crescent is lifted above the spot where, on that most memorable day in the annals of the world, they reared the Holy Cross. It is a scorching, arid, repulsive solitude. A silence broods over the scene that is depressing to the spirits. It makes one think of funerals and death. The hill is barren, rocky and forbidding. No sprig of grass is visible, and only one tree. What Twain did not realize was that his visit to the Holy Land would be fulfilling Bible prophecy that was prophesied by Moses in Deuteronomy. And this prophecy is given in Deuteronomy 29 where the following is stated. Twain was the stranger from a far land that would come to Israel and who would say the things about Israel that were prophesied before the land would be brought back to life. So that the generation to come of your children that shall rise up after you and the stranger that shall come from a far land shall say, when they see the plagues of that land, and the sickness which the Lord hath laid upon it, and that the whole land thereof is brimstone and salt and burning, that it is not sown, nor beareth, nor any grass groweth therein, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and in his wrath. What is even more fascinating is that Twain wrote these words down on the day that this portion was read from the Torah, declaring the fulfillment of this prophecy as Twain was busy writing the words down that would be published two years later. 
When the UN voted on the partition plan in 1947, there was no specific name given to the Jewish state on that day. But on the day that the UN voted to give the land of Palestine back to the Jewish nation, the Torah portion that was read exactly at the time when the UN voted, the word of God declared what the Jewish state would be called. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. The next year when the Jewish state declared their independence, they named the land that was given back to them Israel, just as this portion from Scripture said they would. Another and more recent example is the birth of President Trump, whose name means trumpet. President Trump's birth was not only marked by a blood moon, but there was also a Torah portion that was read on the day of his birth. And that specific portion comes from the only section of scripture in which the creation of a trumpet is described. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver, of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly, and for the journeying of the camps. So on the day that President Trump was born, this Torah portion was read by God's chosen nation around the globe, marking a prophetic fulfillment which we now know had very great significance when we consider the world today. There are many more of these examples that could be mentioned, but in the interest of time, I would like to move on to the Torah portion that will be read during the window of time where Brexit and the deal of the century is likely to be released. When we consider what the Word of God shows us with regards to the time of the end, what should we be expecting and what would it be like? We read the following in Luke. And as it was in the days of Noe, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noe entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven, and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In one of Peter's epistles, the following is written. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overthrown with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Both of these are found in the New Testament and would therefore not be part of the Torah portions that are read by the Jews. If you watched my previous videos, you will remember that I showed you how our enemy has shown us their plans for bringing about great destruction over the earth on November the 2nd, where their plans would seem to point to a false flag attack that is intended to be carried out on Mecca, and in so doing, starting the Third World War on the day that is known to the world as the Day of the Dead, and which the Word of God shows us there will be no escape from for those who will find themselves in it. There is no man that hath power over the Spirit to retain the Spirit, neither hath he power in the day of death, and there is no discharge in that war, neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. Not knowing what we know today, I am sure you would agree that the way in which Ecclesiastes 8 combines the day of death with an inescapable war would otherwise be somewhat strange. It also just so happens that November 2nd, or the Day of the Dead, falls on a Sabbath, and given all the aspects that we see pointed at, these events are not only planned to be carried out at this time, but are actively being brought about by our enemy. You can probably guess which Torah portion will be read on this day. It is called Parashot Noach, 
which is the story of Noah, and given the application in this particular instance, I believe it is something that we should pay very careful attention to, as this is even more confirmation of that which lies right before us. Our Heavenly Father has also provided an invitation to a marriage that He has planned for His Son, and to which you have been invited. That invitation was sent out in November of 2015, and received with understanding in June of 2019, showing us the date on which we need to stand ready as our Heavenly Father promised He would inform us about in Amos 3 verse 7. In Matthew 25, the bridegroom's arrival is announced through a midnight cry ahead of time, and the virgins were all expected to go out to meet him. Not all were ready to do so, but those that were were not caught unawares by the time that he reached the location where the marriage would take place. They went out to meet him before his arrival. I believe it is very important to keep this in mind with regards to the timing of our soon appointment with our bridegroom. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Now there are many who would immediately object to the suggestion that we could know the day and the hour of our appointment with our Redeemer. And if you are one of them, it is entirely your choice whether to ignore our Heavenly Father's invitation to you or not. The Bible clearly shows us that we are not in darkness and that that day will not catch us unawares. So how do we expect to be aware of that day if we continue to believe that the day and the hour will only be known to the Father after the midnight cry has gone out? But ye brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Pay careful attention to what Paul says in this passage. He says that we are not in darkness, so that that day, not that season, will overtake us as a thief. Paul is very specific, and now that our Heavenly Father has sent out the invitation, or the midnight cry, to those that have ears to hear, and who are willing to accept that invitation, we have now been clearly shown the day on which we need to be ready to meet our bridegroom. There are many who believe that September 29th to October 1st would be a window during which our Savior will come for those that are ready to meet Him in the air. And I am in no way saying that we should not be ready to meet Him during this window of time, given our limitations. I am only saying that if we are still here by October 2nd, and given the mounting evidence for the date that our Heavenly Father provided to us through one of His prophets, as He promised, then it would be further confirmation that the invitation we received to attend a holy convocation in which we will be separated from this world and its sinfulness has indeed been set for November the 1st. If you have not seen this prophecy yet, I encourage you to watch this video in which more details are provided and in which our Heavenly Father not only addresses those that will accompany our Savior to the places that He prepared for us, but also those that will remain behind because of their unbelief and the fact that they relied on their own works to earn them their salvation. Time is very short and I would encourage you to watch the entire series of videos in which our enemy's plan is unraveled and exposed so that he should not have an advantage over you as stated in 2 Corinthians 2 verse 11 lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. The inverse of what we read here is also true. If we are willingly ignorant of our enemy's devices, then it is similar to a person running into a battle with an enemy blindfolded, and without any knowledge of the enemy that he will face, and this will give the enemy a great advantage over him. In Hosea we read the following. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. We also have a pattern of the Lord showing us how insight into what is happening in the enemy's camp is given shortly before earthen vessels containing light are removed when a trumpet is sounded, and followed by great destruction over the ungodly. We read about this in the story of Gideon. 
and I would like to thank my brother Damien Jordan for this discussion that led to this discovery. And it came to pass the same night, that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. But if thou fear to go down, go thou with Phura thy servant down to the host, and thou shalt hear what they say, and afterward shall thy hands be strengthened to go down unto the host. Then went he down with Phura his servant unto the outside of the armed men that were in the host. And the Midianites, and the Amalekites, and all the children of the east lay along the valley like grasshoppers for multitude. And their camels were without number, as the sand by the seaside for multitude. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow, and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian, and came unto a tent, and smote it that it fell, and overturned it, that the tent lay along. And his fellow answered and said, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel, for into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the host. And it was so, when Gideon heard the telling of the dream, and the interpretation thereof, that he worshipped and returned into the host of Israel, and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. And he divided the three hundred men into three companies, and put a trumpet in every man's hand, with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And he said unto them, Look on me, and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that, as I do, so shall ye do. When I blow with a trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp, and say, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. And they had but newly set the watch, and they blew the trumpets, and break the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets, and break the pitchers, and held the lamps in their left hands, and the trumpets in their right hands to blow withal, and they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Notice how Gideon is instructed to go down into the camp of the enemy to listen to what they were saying. This greatly encouraged Gideon before the trumpet was sounded that would bring about the destruction of the enemy, just as our discovery of the enemy's plan now encourages us, knowing that our Heavenly Father has also used this to inform us about the midnight cry to us in which he would announce the arrival of the bridegroom to those who are willing to go out to meet him. Gideon is then instructed to blow the trumpet and to break the earthen vessels that contain the light. And this is such a perfect model of what will happen to those who will be changed in the day that the trump of God will be sounded. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Also consider how the earthen vessels that contained the light in Gideon's story are described in 2 Corinthians 4. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Combining this with what we read in the story of Gideon, 
We understand how God wants to encourage us who are the earthen vessels containing the light of the world. And even though we are few, our Heavenly Father gave us insight into what is happening in our enemy's camp so that we can be greatly encouraged and look forward with great hope and faith to the day on which our God will sound His trumpet and the earthen vessels containing the light will be changed to expose God's light to the world which will then be followed by great destruction on the enemy's camp. If you have not been saved yet and if you do not have a personal relationship with your Heavenly Father yet then you have to know that the time during which you can obtain both of these unconditionally is fast running out. If you want to escape all of what will be coming over the earth and see what our Savior had prepared for those that love Him, you have to first realize that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. The Word of God tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and that without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. However, God loved you so much that He decided to offer Himself in your place and to shed His blood on your behalf so that you can receive all of His righteousness. He took all your sins and paid for it with His life. He offers you this free gift of salvation, and what He requires of you is to first admit that you are a sinner, and that there is no good in you that you could offer our Heavenly Father in return for receiving salvation from Him. His word shows us that only perfection is acceptable in the eyes of our Heavenly Father, and while we exist in these corruptible bodies, we will never be able to reach the standard set out by God's word. Then you have to believe in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, who laid his life down for you and who rose again from the grave to sit on the right hand of God the Father. Not only do you have to believe it, but you also have to confess it with your mouth. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If you have done this, then you have received salvation, and the righteousness of Jesus is imputed to you as a shining white robe, without spot or wrinkle, that you can put on when you are given your new glorified body. If you, in any way, rely on your own ability to gain salvation after you have placed your faith in Jesus, you soil that perfectly clean robe with your own filthy rags, and will then be required to wash it again in the blood of the Lamb, an opportunity that will be offered during the tribulation to those who have soiled their clean robes by adding their own works to their faith in Jesus as the Son of God. Know that our Heavenly Father really loves you, and that there is no need for you to suffer Satan's unrestrained wrath, which is soon coming over the earth, and as a judgment and trial over those who have rejected salvation and who will be left behind. I give you permission to download and re-upload this series of videos in order to share this warning with others. Please help me share this information, as it is being blocked by most social media platforms and only reaching a very small audience at the moment. Your help in this regard will be greatly appreciated and I believe it will also be greatly rewarded. May our Heavenly Father bless you and keep you as we continue to watch for our redemption that is clearly visible on the horizon.